The Curse of Israel. Narration by Lael Israel. History and culture are vital to the survival of a people because it connects them to the various families upon the earth. It gives them identity. For nearly 2,000 years, the world has actively or passively maintained one of the best kept secrets on the face of the earth, and that is the true identity of African Americans who are the ancient biblical Jews. While nation after nation has already self-proclaimed themselves as the Jews, the Jews themselves, African Americans in mass, are the only nation of people on earth who don't know their true identity. This is not a coincidence. We are completely ignored in the scope of local, regional, or international affairs because we are nationless. Gentiles have said that we are cursed with the curse of Canaan, son of Ham. Stumbling over skin color, the nations cannot acknowledge that there are two seeds or tribes of people of color upon the earth, Ham and Shem. We are the hidden ones of Psalms 83 verse 3 who have constantly been mistaken for Africans. Knowing we are Jews, we've even been accused of anti-Semitism in spite of the fact that we can prove it through scripture and secular history. How ironic. However, it is true that we are cursed, but not through Ham. Through Shem, the wrath of Yahweh, through the curse is so visible upon us, it easily identifies the children of Israel. Thy first father has sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and I have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. Isaiah 43, verse 27 and 28. Prophecy says that the curses are a sign so that African Americans would know in these latter days the reason why these things have befallen our people and turn back to Yahweh. Israel is Yahweh's timepiece by which the entire world can see the signs upon us and know what time it is. Our own history is the biblical story which tells how we were chosen, chained, and cursed. Feared by the Egyptians during the last 100 years of their sojourn in Egypt, Israel's images are verified by the drawings on Egyptian walls, like this relief of Hebrews, recording everything from our features and skin tones of every hue as our forefathers were held by their locks in subjugation and worse. With crafty counsel, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. Exodus chapter 1, verse 14. After building their granaries and treasure cities, leading our fathers out of bondage into the wilderness to serve Yahweh, there Moses presented them with Yahweh's law and warned Israel. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Deuteronomy chapter 30. After conquering the numerous African nations in the land, they entered the land of Canaan, our homeland. However, the paganism of the African nations that surrounded Israel continued to conquer and influence them in idolatry. Chastised early in our history for ignoring Yahweh's laws, Israel was made to serve the Africans again as slaves, as well as other Shemites for a total of 111 years recorded in the Book of Judges. In 800 BCE, not 40 years after King Solomon's death, beginning to experience the curse of the law for having repeatedly broken it, our nation became divided into two separate kingdoms. For their rebellion, Yahweh sent the Assyrians against northern Israel in 700 BCE. They were known for their barbarism and grisly methods of torture like impaling Hebrews. According to the February 1991 Biblical Archaeology Review, numerous Assyrian writings boast of the conquest of Israel and a Judean city called Lachish. King Sennacherib recorded tearing down 46 strong walled towns and many small villages of Jerusalem, enslaving the 10 northern tribes 
and the Judites of Lachish, they were scattered to the far corners of the earth as it is to this day. The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sebabaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria, northern Israel, instead of the children of Israel. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. Unfortunately, Judah, Levi, and parts of Benjamin left in the land served Yahweh with lip service instead of their hearts. Thus, 200 years later, the major world powers that were sent upon the earth would punish Judah beginning with Babylon. In 606 BCE, the Babylonians, the Africans and Arabs began their aggression by extortion, demanding payment from Jews for protection. But our rebellion against the king caused him to attack Jerusalem on three separate occasions. Taking the most noble Hebrew slaves, like Daniel who was thrown to the lions, and the three Hebrew boys who were cast into the fiery furnace, this left the poorest and the weakest of our people in the land. The last siege of Jerusalem produced devastating pestilence and famine, causing our people to stoop to cannibalism of their own children to avoid starvation. But the prophet Jeremiah had warned our forefathers that Babylon was sent by Yahweh to destroy the city and all who resisted. Told they would serve Babylon for just 70 years, it was the beginning of more curses to come for Israel's continued disregard of Yahweh's laws. And if you will not for all this listen to me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 18. What horrors would be seven times worse than this curse of cannibalism and slavery? It would be a promise of war by the sword, persecution and death for Jerusalem to be meted out by the nations that would rule over them. Using the holy temple treasures as ordinary drinking mugs in an orgy-like celebration, handwriting appeared on the wall announcing the fall of the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persians, the Russians and Iranians, taking possession without so much as a protest from Babylon. It was Cyrus the Mede, the Russian, in 539 BCE, who freed Israel to return to Jerusalem with the temple treasures and instructions to rebuild the temple. Failing to remember the warning of punishment seven times more severe, most of our people had assimilated into Babylonian culture and were not interested in returning home. The Medio persian Empire marked the end of the 70-year captivity, but it was also the beginning of the time of the Gentiles, or Europeans, that would rule for 2,520 years, accelerating the punishment of our people. Around 331 BCE, Alexander the Great conquered the Medes and Persians, leaving Jerusalem basically untouched, except for their influence on our culture. Always more acceptable of other cultures than our own, Israel quickly assimilated into Greek culture and language. They built gyms, sponsored sports and games, and adopted Greek names but held on to the worship of one God. Sadly, it wouldn't be long before they would be the entertainment in the same sporting arenas they loved through death by wild animals, burnings at the stake, and fighting as gladiators to the death. When Alexander died, his four generals fought bitterly for rulership, dividing his territory into four parts. Jerusalem, in the middle of the struggle, was seized from the Ptolemies by Antiochus IV of the Seleucids, who ruled from Syria. In 175 BCE, Antiochus ordered the full conversion of our people to the Greeks' pagan culture, outlawing circumcision of our males. They forced our people to eat pork, sent many of them to Greek lands as slaves, executed anyone found worshiping on the seventh-day Sabbath, and defiled the temple by dedicating it to Zeus with the sacrifice of a filthy pig on Yahweh's holy altar. In one of our largest rebellions in history, the War of the Maccabees of the Hasmonean dynasty, it would liberate Jerusalem for a time, but only until Rome stormed the scene.